The Absolute at Large by Karel Chopek Translated by David Wiley Performed by Francis Pass Chapter 20 St. Kilda St. Kilda is a small island, hardly more than a piece of volcanic rock left over from the Pliocene, some way to the west of the Hebrides. A few stunted bushes, some patches of heather and grass you don't find anywhere else, many nesting seagulls and semi-arctic butterflies of the polyomatis family. That, in short, is all the life on this godforsaken guard post of our continent, stuck between the incessant pounding of the sea and the equally incessant rain of the clouds. Apart from that, St. Kilda has always been uninhabited, and always will be. However, toward the end of December, His Majesty's ship, Dragon, dropped anchor there. A swarm of woodworkers came out from the ship carrying beams and boards, and by evening they had built a large, low, wooden hut. The next day came painters and decorators bearing with them the very best and most comfortable furniture. On the third day, the bowels of the ship gave forth stewards and cooks and wine waiters, who equipped the hut with crockery, wine, preserved foods, and everything else needed for a man of culture who was also both powerful and particular. On the morning of the fourth day, the English Prime Minister, Sir O'Patterney, arrived on the HMS Edwin. Half an hour later, the American Ambassador, Horatio Bum, arrived. Then, each in turn and each on a warship, came the Chinese plenipotentiary, Mr. K, the French Prime Minister, Monsieur de Dieu, General Buchton from the Russian Empire, the Imperial German Chancellor, Dr. Verm, the Italian Minister, Prince Trivellino, and the Japanese Ambassador, Baron Yanato. There were sixteen English gunboats cruising around the island to prevent any journalists' landing, as this meeting of the world's supreme powers, promptly called by the all-powerful Sir O'Patterney, had to take place in the greatest secrecy. Indeed, there was even a Danish whaling schooner, the Nils Hans, that was sunk by torpedo after it had tried to slide past the blockade of gunboats by night. Not only the twelve-man crew were drowned that night, but also the political correspondent of the Chicago Tribune, Mr. Joe Hashick. Nonetheless, Mr. Bill Pridham, reporter for the New York Herald, was on St. Kilda all that time, and hard at work disguised as a wine waiter, and we have him to thank for the few reports about this historic meeting that survived the catastrophic events that were to follow. In Mr. Bill Pridham's opinion, this meeting of political leaders took place in such an isolated spot so that the Absolute could have no direct influence on it. Anywhere else, it would have been possible for the Absolute to creep its way into this assembly of eminent men in the form of inspiration, enlightenment, or even as a miracle, and that, of course, is something unheard of in higher political circles. The conference's primary objective seems to have been to achieve agreement between the colonial powers, Nations had to agree not to support religious movements on the territory of other states. This was in response to the agitation instigated by Germany in Congo and Senegambia, as well as the covert French influence on the Medi uprising in Mohammedan areas governed by the English, and in particular the Japanese carburetors sent to Bengal where the revolt committed by a number of different sects was horrifying. Meetings took place behind closed doors, and the only report published was one saying that Germany would acknowledge spheres of influence in Kurdistan, and that Japan would acknowledge spheres of influence in a number of Greek islands. The Anglo-Japanese alliance and the French-German-Russian alliance seemed to settle this matter with an unusual level of friendly agreement, or even enthusiasm. That afternoon, G. H. Bondi arrived at the Supreme Council on his private gunboat. It was not until five o'clock, English time, that the celebrated diplomats adjourned for lunch and that Bill Pridham first had the chance to hear what the representatives of the highest powers had to say with his own ears. Over lunch they talked about sport and actresses. Sir O'Patterney, with his white mane of hair like a poet and his alert eyes, talked excitedly about salmon fishing with His Excellency Monsieur de Dieu, the Prime Minister of France, whose lively movements, loud speech, and a certain je ne sais quoi betrayed him as the former lawyer that he was. Baron Yanato refused any drink offered to him, and merely smiled and listened as if his mouth were full of water. Dr. Verm looked through his documents. General Buchton walked up and down the room with Prince Trivellino. Horatio Bum performed a series of carambles by himself on the billiard table. I have seen his excellent overhand triple views are with my own eyes, a move which any connoisseur of the game could only admire. While Mr. K, a Mandarin in the Empire of the Sun and looking like a very dry and yellow old man, was going through some kind of Buddhist rosary. Suddenly, all the diplomats formed a group around Monsieur de Dieu, who was saying, Yes, gentlemen, ce soir. We cannot remain indifferent to the absolute. Either we acknowledge it or we deny it. We in France are more inclined to the latter approach. 
That is because in your country it seems to be anti-militarist, said Prince Trevellino spitefully. No, gentlemen, the Jew exclaimed, we cannot depend on this. The army of France is unaffected. Anti-militarist, bah! In France there have been so many anti-militarists. Gentlemen, this absolute is something of which you must be careful. It is a demagogue, a communist, a bigot, and the devil knows what else, but always it is a radical. We oui, un rabouliste, ce soir. It goes by the strangest of popular names. It associates with the crowd. In your country, your excellency, he said, suddenly turning to Prince Trevellino, it is a nationalist, drunk with delusions of the Roman Empire. But you should be careful, your excellency. That is what it does in cities, but in the country it associates with the church and performs miracles in the name of the Virgin. With one hand it works for the Vatican, and with the other for Kiernal. I say it has some scheme or other, or... Well, I don't know. Gentlemen, we can all say quite openly that the absolute causes difficulties for all of us. It takes an interest in sport, too, in America, said Horatio Bum thoughtfully as he leant on his billiard cue. Indeed, it's a great sportsman and likes every kind of game. It's achieved some fantastic records in sport, as well as in religion. It's a socialist. It's in with the drinkers and changes water into wine. One time, at a banquet in the White House, it, uh, it got everyone really drunk. No one was drinking anything but water, but it turned the water into liquor in their stomachs. That is remarkable, said Sir O'Patterney with surprise. To us British, it seems rather more to be a conservative. It behaves like an all-powerful clergyman. Meetings, parades, preaching on the street and such things. I rather get the impression it doesn't like us liberals very much. Baron Yonato smiled and told the other diplomats that the absolute was very much at home in his country. A very, very lovable god has adapted very well. Very great Japanese. How you mean Japanese? expostulated General Buchton. What you're talking about? The absolute is a Russian, a proper Russian, a Slav. The broad Russian soul, your excellency. It keep company with us lads. Our Archimandrite, he organized procession for absolute. Ten thousand candles, many people, thick as seeds of poppy. All Christian souls from all over Russia meet together. He do also miracles for us, our father, the general added as he made the sign of the cross and bowed from the waist. The chancellor of the German Empire approached, listened in silence for a while, and said, Yes, it knows how to give people what they want. Everywhere it goes, it takes on the mentality of that place. It seems remarkably adaptable for its age. If we have seen how it works among our neighbors, in the Czech lands, for instance, it behaves like a colossal individualist. Every individual in that country has whatever absolute he wants. In Germany, we have an absolute that is part of the state. It immediately became highly aware of the importance of the state. In Poland, it has an effect like that of alcohol, but in Germany, its effect is as if... Hurve Ordnung, verstehen Sie mich? Even in the Catholic areas of your country, asked Prince Trivellino with a smile. There are some local variations, Dr. Verm thought. Gentlemen, you need attach no way to this matter. Germany now is more united than ever in the past, but thank you, Prince Trevellino, for the Catholic carburetors that you smuggle into our land. Fortunately, they are very low quality, just like all Italian products. Order, gentlemen, order, Sir O'Patterney intervened. Do let us remain neutral in matters of religion. As far as I am concerned, I catch salmon using a double rod. One time I caught one as long as this, do you see? Fourteen pounds. And what of the papal nonce? Dr. Verm asked quietly. The Holy See requires us to maintain peace at whatever cost. It requests that mysticism be forbidden by law. In England, that cannot be done, and even... Fourteen pounds it was, I tell you, heaven, it was all I could do to stop it jumping back into the water. The smile on Baron Yanato's face became even more polite. But neutrality is not something that we wish for. The absolute is a great Japanese. The whole world will be able to adopt Japanese faith. We also intend to send out missionaries to teach our faith. Baron, began Sir O'Patterney seriously, you are aware that we have excellent relations between our two states. England can adopt Japanese faith, Baron Yanato smiled, and relations will be even more excellent. Wait one minute, General Buchton said loudly. No Japanese faith. If any faith, then orthodox faith. And you know why? Firstly, because it's orthodox faith, and secondly, because it's Russian faith, and thirdly, because the Lord want it, and fourthly, led because Russia have biggest army. I tell you straight, I always support the army just as we should do. So, if any faith, 
than our orthodox faith. Gentlemen, this will not be possible, said Sir O'Patterney crossly. This is not what we're here for. Quite right, said Dr. Verm. We need to agree on a unified approach to God. Which one? said Mr. K, the Chinese plenipotentiary, suddenly as he finally raised his wrinkly eyelid. Which one? a startled Dr. Verm repeated. But there is only one God. A Japanese God, said Baron Yanato, smiling sweetly. The Orthodox God, shouted the general, as red as a turkey. There is no other. Buddha, said Mr. K, allowing his eyelid to droop once more, so that he was now indistinguishable from a desiccated mummy. Sir O. Patterny stood up sharply. Gentlemen, he said, all of you, please come with me. And with that, their excellencies went back into the debating chamber. At eight o'clock, General Buchton ran out of the chamber with his fists clenched and his face purple. Dr. Verm came after him, crossly arranging his documents. A red-faced Sir O'Patterney, in complete disregard for decorum, left the chamber with his hat on his head. Next, Monsieur de Dieu came out in silence. Prince Trevellino came out looking very pale, and Baron Yanato came out with a fixed smile on his face. The last to leave was Mr. K, his eyes downcast and his fingers working over his very long black rosary. So ended the report that Mr. Bill Pridham published in the Herald. There is no official communique issued about this conference, apart from the one mentioned above about spheres of influence, and so if any resolution was agreed on, it had little effect. Not least because, to use a gynecological phrase, the womb of destiny was about to produce something unexpected. Chapter 21. A Dispatch Snow falls on the mountains. It falls in large, silent flakes all through the night, building up without cease to a blanket that lies half a meter deep on the ground. Silence falls on the woods. The only sound is the infrequent snap of a branch that can no longer bear the weight of snow on it, a sound that penetrates only a short distance through the thick blanket of silence. Then it becomes harsher, and an icy wind sweeps in from the north. The gentle flakes give way to hailstones that fly in your face and pierce your cheeks. The fallen snow whirls up from the ground as sharp needles. White clouds of it tumble down from the trees and throw a blizzard upwards, twisting round and striving to reach the darkness of the sky. It snows from the earth to the sky. In the darkness of the woods, the branches groan and screech. A tree breaks with a crash and scatters the undergrowth as it falls. But these harsh noises seem to evaporate into the howling of the wind. They are dispersed by its whistlings, its fitful thunderings, and its cutting screams. When, for a short interlude, it pauses, the squeals and scrapes of the frozen snow can be heard underfoot like powdered glass. In the hills above Spindler's Mill, a postman is hurrying with a telegram. He struggles hard to make his way through the deep snow. His cap is down over his ears and held in place with a red scarf. Woolen gloves are on his hands and a colorful muffler around his neck, but he is none the less cold. Well, he thought to himself, in an hour and a half I'll get to Bear Valley, and I can hire a sleigh for the way down. What the hell made anyone want to send a telegram in weather like this? About to make his way across a footbridge, the postman was assaulted by a swirl of wind that twisted him round and round. His hands numb with the cold, he caught hold of a sign showing tourist information. For God's sake, he said to himself, I can't go on like this. A mass of snow swirled its way through the air towards him. It flew closer, then it came at him, and he could do nothing but hold his breath. A thousand needles pierced the skin of his face, intruded under the scarf round his neck. Somewhere in his trousers the snow found a place to enter and reach his body. Under his frozen clothes he was wet. The flurry passed on, and the messenger wished he could go back to the post office. Marek, he said, repeating the address to himself. He's not even from here. But it was an express telegram. How was he to know it wasn't a family matter, or... It became slightly calmer, and the postman set out across the footbridge and up the hill alongside the stream. The snow scraped under his heavy boots and made the terrible cold even worse. The wind howled again. Snow fell from the trees in large masses, and the postman received one load on his head in the back of his neck. A stream of icy water ran down his back. But the worst was the way his damned feet kept slipping on the snow and the steepness of the track as he made his way upward. And just then a whirlwind of snow unleashed itself. It burst down on him like a wall of whiteness. Before he had time to turn his back to it, it struck him hard in the face, even though he ducked down, gasping for breath. He fell forward. He sat with his back to the wind, but became afraid he would become buried under the snow. He stood up and tried to climb higher, but once again he slipped and fell on both hands, tried to stand up and slid several meters down. 
Hardly able to breathe, he caught hold of a tree. Damn it, he said to himself. I've just got to get up this hill. He succeeded in going up a few paces, but fell again and slid down the slope on his belly. Now he climbed up on all fours. His gloves were soaked, his leggings let the snow in, but he had to go on up. Above all, he could not stay where he was. Sweat and melting snow ran down his face. He could see nothing through the snow and seemed to have lost his way. He wept out loud and clawed his way upwards. But it is hard to climb on all fours when you are wearing a long overcoat. He stood upright and struggled forward against the force of the wind. For each half a step upward, he slid two steps back down. He seemed to make some progress, but his feet slipped out from under him and, the snow stabbing needles into his face, he was back down again. When he stood up, he saw that he had lost his stick. And all the time, clouds of snow flew across the hills, snatching at the crags, swirling, whirling, howling. The postman sobbed and coughed with fear in the effort of his journey. He climbed upwards, stopped, made another step, stopped, turned and gasped for breath, then another step upwards. Jesus Christ! He took hold of a tree. What time could it be? He drew his watch in its yellow translucent case out from the pocket of his waistcoat. It was sealed shut with snow. It might be getting dark soon. Should he go back? But he must be near the top by now. The wind stopped coming at him in gusts and became a continuous gale. The clouds rushed straight at the hillside, a gray and dirty fog filled with hurtling flakes of snow. The snow flung itself horizontally through the air, straight into his face and gluing his eyes, nose, and mouth shut. To clear it, half thawed from his ears and eye sockets, he had only fingers which were wet and numb with the cold. All down his front, he was covered in a layer of snow five centimeters thick. His coat was almost too stiff to move, as stiff as a board and just as heavy. His shoes, too, were heavy, and gathering a thick layer of snow on their soles with every step. And in the woods, darkness was falling. But it's hardly two in the afternoon, for God's sake. Suddenly a yellow-greenish dark fell, and the snowfall became very heavy. The flakes were as big as your hand, wet and heavy, so many of them twisting and flying around him that it became impossible to tell earth from sky. He could not see where he put his feet. Each breath drew in flakes of snow. He was wading through a swirling veil that enveloped him to well above his head, and he made each step blind, tunneling his way through the storm. Just one instinct, to keep on going. Just one desperate wish, to breathe something other than snow. The snow, halfway up his thighs, sucked at his boots as he tried to draw his feet out of it. He struggled on through the whiteness, digging out his own path which closed again behind him. Back down in the cities, the snow was falling in fine little flakes that melted on the black mud. Lights came on in the shops, people sat under lamps in bright cafes and grumbled about what a dark and gloomy day it was. Countless bulbs shone their light out far and wide all across the city and sparkled in the watery mud. In the upland meadow, under its coating of snow, there was just one light shining. Through the blizzard it was hardly perceptible. It danced from side to side. It disappeared and reappeared. But it was there, and it was life. In the hut in Bear Valley, there was light. It was five o'clock and already quite dark when something shapeless came to a stop in front of the hut. That something spread out its thick white wings and began to beat itself and shed layers of snow tens of centimeters thick. An overcoat became visible from under the snow, and under the coat two legs which kicked at the stone doorstep, dropping piles of snow. This was the postman. He entered the hut, and sitting at the table he saw a thin man. He was going to offer a polite greeting, but his voice failed him completely. He could only wheeze a couple words, as if steam were being released. The man stood up. My God, what's brought you out in an onslaught like this? You might well never have got through it. The postman nodded and gasped. That was madness, the man admonished him. You need some tea. Where were you trying to get to, old man? Martin's hut? The postman shook his head and opened his leather bag. It was full of snow, but he drew the telegram out from it, frozen solid so that it crackled when bent. Mark, he gasped. What's that you say? the man asked. Is Mr. Mark here? said the postman, one syllable at a time, and looking accusingly at the man. Yes, that's me, he exclaimed. You've got something for me? Let me see it, quick. Mark opened the dispatch. It read, Your assumptions confirmed. Bondi. Nothing more. This recording is under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike License. Music was composed by Uzair Hajibayov and performed by the United States Navy Band. The book was written by Karel Chopek, translated by David Wiley, and performed by Francis Bass.